1990, the UK was impacted by recession. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's massively unpopular poll tax, which charged everyone the same fee for government services regardless of income, had been tested in Scotland in 1989 and was now set to be rolled out in England and Wales. There were over 6,000 documented anti-poll tax demonstrations or actions in early 1990, culminating with massive unrest dubbed the Poll Tax Riots on March 31st. Roughly 180 to 250,000 people are believed to have joined the march from Kennington Park to Trafalgar Square. In the ensuing chaos, 113 people were injured and a later investigation determined the blame lay on internal police incompetency. Cops were filmed in over 50 hours of footage assaulting people and or arresting them on trumped up charges. The Tories, led by Margaret Thatcher, were 20% behind the Labour Party after the poll tax was introduced, and the Iron Lady's key enemies saw a potential end. She had been in charge for 11 years, and during this period, the conservative Tories hadn't won more than 44% of the vote. Her victories always been benefited from a third party taking votes away from Labour. Thatcher's main enemy was Tory Michael Heseltine, who was pro-Europe while Thatcher had been drifting towards a primary relationship with America. Thatcher initially backed the European Union and its goal of erecting a single market, but later balked at the idea of one central European bank and currency, putting her out of step with dissenters in her party. Her deputy prime minister, Jeffrey Howe, dramatically resigned, giving a speech in which he accused Thatcher of being a poor leader, utilizing a cricket metaphor by saying the bats have been broken by the team captain. This resignation encouraged Michael Heseltine to challenge her in the annual election. Though Thatcher won more votes than Heseltine, a 1975 rule requiring a 15% lead triggered a second vote. Though Thatcher assured the press she would continue fighting, after meeting with members of her cabinet, who may have misled her on her chances of losing, she pulled out of the race, stunning the country. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years and we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. Interestingly, a fictional version of the Iron Lady quit her prime minister role on a new TV show called House of Cards one week before the real one did. Another Tory named John Major eventually became prime minister and he beat Labour leader Neil Kinnock in the general election. Thatcher had been against joining the European exchange rate mechanism, which required members to keep its exchange rate above a certain limit. When John Major became prime minister, he joined the ERM. And on September 16, 1992, the UK government was forced to withdraw sterling from the ERM because the pound was collapsing, leading to the day of economic freefall being called Black Wednesday. First, the Bank of England and other central banks spent several billion pounds worth of foreign currencies, buying the pounds others wanted to sell. Then, the Bank of England raised interest rates 2% to try to persuade speculators to stop selling. When that failed, it raised them another 3%. But still, the enemy kept coming. By the end of the day, the pound had fallen several pennies below its supposed ERM floor. The government had to act. This ultimately damaged the Conservative Party's reputation and the economy in the following years. Of course, all of that gets drowned out when you think about the royal family, whose 1992 was one for the tabloids. So before the 90s, much of the news and official writings about the royal family were positive and sanitized. While tabloids had become more invasive in the 80s, gossip about the royal family really rose in the 90s, and 92 was a standout year. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. Diana, her true story, the best-selling tell-all book, was published in May. It revealed precious details about Prince Charles' affair with Camilla Parker Bowles and Diana's eating disorder and poor mental health, removing the veil of secrecy from the uptight royal family. Diana had secretly provided information to the author, Andrew Morton, via audio recordings. The book offered the fascinated public a different behind-the-scenes view of the powerful monarchy, whose credibility and implied superiority was now being questioned. The Daily Mirror has published excerpts of what it claims is an intimate 1989 telephone conversation between the prince and his former girlfriend, Camilla Parker Bowles. 
Buckingham Palace has refused to comment. A November 1992 fire at Windsor Castle caused $47.5 million in damage, and it was to be paid for with public funds, causing outrage. According to one poll, 76% of Britons wanted to cut taxpayers' support for the royals. The royal family is Britain's longest-running soap opera. The British taxpayer funds this spectacle to the tune of £10 million, pounds, or $15 million, a year. A small price to pay for fairy tale romances. But is that price too high when the ending and the princess are unhappy? To quell criticism of the crown, earlier that year, the queen volunteered to start paying taxes on her personal income and take her children off the public payroll. After the fire, her taxes began. At the time, one in 10 workers was unemployed and the country was in its longest recession since the 30s. The same month of the fire, Prince Charles and Princess Diana went on a trip to South Korea and looked so miserable that a reporter called them the glums. Right after in December, it was announced that the pair was separating. Throughout this same period, Diana continued her work as a philanthropist, donating money to various causes from HIV AIDS to cancer research. To learn more about the failure of royal romances like Tampon Gate and the impact of the press, check out the deep cut on the intellectual media Patreon at the end of this month. While the 1200 year old British monarchy was going through changes and drama, the UK was becoming more modern. First, the UK was the home of Tim Berners-Lee, who was creating the World Wide Web in 1990. In December 1993, British Parliament ended the practice of stores being closed on Sunday, with The Guardian reporting large stores will be allowed to open for a maximum of six hours between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Smaller shops will be allowed to stay open for as long as they like. This was after massive backlash from the Labor Party called to protect workers who refused to work on Sunday. That same year, the drug that will become known as Viagra was synthesized by a group of Pfizer scientists in Sandwich, Kent. On May 6, 1994, the English Channel Tunnel officially opened after six years of construction linking underwater trains between the British island and the European mainland. The Queen and the President of France attended the opening ceremony of the $10 billion achievement. The Queen started her historic journey from the new Channel Tunnel Terminal at London's Waterloo Station, aboard one of the Eurostar passenger trains that will eventually whisk travellers from London to Paris and Brussels in around three hours. Despite innovations, the old problems persisted in the UK. The early 90s saw the continuation of provisional Irish Republican Army resistance, aka the Troubles. One of the most significant was the mortar attack at 10 Downing Street in 1991, which houses the Prime Minister. After three more bombs, the IRA announced a ceasefire in 1994. The 1991 UK census was the first to include a question about ethnicity, and it revealed that black people were 1.6% of the country's population. Many were immigrants from former and current British colonies, and they of course dealt with racism. 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence was an aspiring architect when he was stabbed to death on April 22, 1993, while waiting for a bus with his best friend in Southeast London. His parents, who immigrated from Jamaica to the UK in the 60s, were pissed that police didn't investigate the murder quickly enough. They didn't search suspects' homes for four days and waited two weeks to arrest. By June 5th, five white men were arrested, but two would never be indicted because of a lack of evidence and the other three were acquitted, despite the fact that they were members of a gang who committed other racist attacks in the weeks prior. Stephen Lawrence's murder and the soft handling of the culprits would impact black UK and the media in the second half of the 90s.